Hello, Stephen Tellis. Hello, Glenn Lowry. Hey, yeah, indeed, I am Glenn Lowry at Brown University and of bloggingheads.tv and The Glenn Show. And I'm talking to Stephen Tellis, who's my guest on The Glenn Show. He's professor of politics at Johns Hopkins University. Stephen and I go back a quarter century or so. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what we're here to talk about, Steve, but it probably has something to do with the pending election. I know what we're talking about, Glenn, which is that we are going to pretend that we are uh, creating, like a Frankenstein monster, a um, irrational Donald Trump. I think that's what we talked about, was we were going to say, if, if there was going to be somebody more or less trying to um, do the thing that Donald Trump is trying to do, um, what would that look like if that person uh, actually had any interest in public policy, uh, any interest in some kind of policy coherence, um, because one of the characteristics of Donald Trump, right, is he seems to have no, and, you know, this is in some sense both a strength and a weakness, is he has no need for coherence or consistency on policy. You know, he's happy to say one thing one day, one thing the other, to the point where he doesn't seem to actually care about it. Um, so we're not uh, just going to say, what should a conservative do? We're going to say, assuming that you're going to try to do something like what Trump is doing, what would that look like? Okay, okay. Now, there's a certain school of thought that says consistency and coherence is overrated. And when we talk about politics, we're talking about inspiration. When we talk about leadership, we're talking about vision. Uh, and when we talk about inspiration and vision, we're not talking about logical lines of deduction, but we're talking about painting pictures, moving people, and so forth and so on. So perhaps it doesn't matter so much that uh, Mr. T is not so coherent. Uh, but, 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 yeah. Well, at some the, point, though, he has to govern, right? At some point, he, if you're thinking about how you would actually put a coalition together over time, right, it would actually have to do stuff out there in the world and have it actually work or not work or make sense or not okay. make sense. And so in part, what we're doing is assuming the, the kind of political coalition that Trump himself says he wants to build. Let, let, me, let me put it this way, see if you agree. Okay. So there, there's Trump, the, the, the person, the personality, the individual, uh, profoundly flawed in ways that we could talk about at length. And then there is um, this movement. Uh, I put the words in inverted commas, but I'm not sure that I wouldn't be removing those commas at some point. Uh, I'm sure you know that tens of thousands of people turn out to these rallies all over the country to hear from Donald Trump and that they're rabid in their enthusiasms and so forth and so on, and that he does stand uh, as the figurehead for something that has mobilized some significant um, minority, perhaps, you know, 40 percent of the population, of uh, disquiet and a desire for a populist America first uh, oriented uh, uh, kind of uh, nationalist uh, 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 political aspiration. And although the character Trump is flawed, the movement, again in inverted commas, uh, is at least worthy of some dissecting. And I think then what we're talking about is what a fit leader of such a movement might have to say and propose and do and so forth and so on. Right. And again, I would say it as a, as a Democrat, another way of saying this is, what would a Trumpism be that I would be genuinely afraid of? Right. Um, that is, that would be, you know, that would, you know, make some sense in policy terms that could actually govern as Trumpism, right. And that would not ostentatiously limit its political you know, it's political uh, coalition over time, okay, right? So, what so might an ex and I, I think this, like, and in a way, I can even put a name to it, right? What would I be terrified that Tom Cotton would run on in 2020, right? Who I really do think is going to be the one. Tom see, Cotton, the senator from Mississippi. Arkansas. 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 Uh, yeah, I know. People, it's easy to make that mistake. All right, he, but, but uh, he's, he wears a bow tie. Uh, he's he looks like he's in his 40s. He's very articulate he's a, and very smart. A, yeah, he was a he's a um, very articulate, very smart guy, um, uh, a veteran. Right. Yeah. Uh, very conservative. But clearly one thing he's been trying to do was, was try to figure out how to connect up the sort of Trump coalition with one way to think about this is sort of the reformicon 
more sort of serious public policy um, thing that you might associate with somebody like Raihan Salam, right? Okay, but before that, before that's what I'm going to do, I, I just want to interject before we get into. I mean, and this is your uh, this is your wheelhouse, and I'm very happy to be learning from you about all of this. Uh, visionary political, uh, uh, you know, calculation and analysis. But before, can we just like lay down a baseline about what Trump is for? Uh, right. I mean, let me let me try. Okay. Okay. Uh, he wants to build a wall and he wants to secure the border. He wants to deport criminal aliens and he wants to prevent drugs from coming into the country. He says you can't have a country if you don't have a border. So that's one of the things that he's for. Right. He says, my economic program is uh, explicable in three words, jobs, jobs, jobs. He says, our leaders have been stupid and our clock has been being cleaned in the international sort of political mercantilist economic national competition in a globalized world. The Chinese are doing this. The Mexicans are doing that and so forth and so on. So he's going to get tough and he's going to do that. He says... He says, um, we're no longer respected on the world stage. I want to rebuild the military. And he wants to invest however many gazillion dollars in rebuilding the military. America's back. We're going to be respected. We're going to be strong. We're going to stop the apology tours. We're not going to get pushed around by the uh, demagogic president of the Philippines or right. the, you know, uh, uh, the, the Putin uh, uh, KGB types or whatnot. We're going to be back. So he wants. He has a he has a different idea about what he's he wants to do about that. Yeah, you do this uh, very well, Glenn. You should actually consider uh, running for president in 2020 on the Republican ticket too. You got. I think you got what it takes. Or or maybe I can just get called in as a consultant at a very high rate. Uh, there after- you go. <laughs> I think that's the way. I think that. I think that's the way forward. Okay, so. Uh, I guess there's two. I mean, there's I, two I just want to say one more thing. Let me put one more thing. He says the inner cities are falling apart. The democratic suzerainty there has uh, led to not. What do you have to lose? I can fix it. I'm going to invest in this problem. America first. Okay. So there, those are somehow pillars or some of the main pillars of the Trump thing. And a, what's wrong with that? Or b, to the extent that there's not anything, pre, you know, presumptively wrong with it. How could it be more effectively uh, packaged and, and, and advocated? So I guess I would say that when I started even thinking about what Trumpism is, I think of the policy stuff as all kind of epiphenomenal, all right. right? All that right. is, what, what's, what's before all that is some theory about what the Republican coalition is supposed to look like, right? Um, and there was a theory before Trump about what that was supposed to be, which is exactly what the Republican coalition was before But with really just to say with more Hispanics and some more women. Right. And that theory was and this was sort of the Marco Rubio strategy was you were going to try to really double down on not seeming intolerant. You were going to be more you were going to try and get a deal to liquidate the immigration issue to take that off the table. You were going to try and, you know, stop scaring women. So, you know, so thoroughly. Right. Um, and to, you know, get a few points of that back. And that's how the Republican Party was supposed to succeed. And that was sort of the the documents that all came out after 2012 all said that all the Republican ones. Right. And so Trump. Right. One way to think about Trump strategy was to say the hell with that. Right. That's not how we're going to do it. We're going right. to do it by basically um pushing up the level of white support for the Republican Party, right? I think that's the only way to, to put it, right, is we're not going to chase after um, uh, uh, Hispanics anymore, right? That's, that's a mistake, right? We can actually get the percentage of whites um, up, uh, and this is how we're going to do it. And we're partially going to do it by not being so economically royalist anymore, right? That's the policy switch. We're not I, don't, switch. I don't agree with that characterization, but you, you go don't? ahead and, and I'll no, come no, back. No, well, tell me what's wrong with that one. What's wrong with I mean, the well, basically – Well, gives, I, no, no, no. I, I think uh, – I mean, one of the pillars that I was just mentioning was the direct appeal to blacks that I can fix it. Your, your uh, you know, uh, situation is pretty miserable. You're not doing that well. That doesn't feel to me like necessarily an appeal to white support, although I don't want to deny the fact I've looked at these rallies. Most of the people who are there are most I, is understating it. Yeah. Oh, OK, right. essentially all of the people who are there, there, there are a few here and there. I saw Don King, <laughs> the discredited uh, ex-con 
uh, uh, fight promoter uh, at a black church promoting Trump, et cetera. But I, but let's come to that later. I don't want to I don't want to argue the main point, but that's not right. No, again, but, so, but, again, but, but, but here's what I want to say. It's Democrats who have construed Trump's uh, pointing to criminal aliens as a dire threat that he wants to uh, stifle. It's Democrats who have pointed to Trump's alleged uh, anti-Hispanic sentiments because of some, um, you know, uh, ill-considered remarks that he made about a Mexican judge or because of the fact that he wants to get tough on border security, who have characterized that as anti uh, Latino. I don't, I, mean, I, I don't know that those positions are in and of themselves anti-Latino any more were... than advocating stop and frisk is ipso facto anti-black. No, I did, well, hey, I didn't say any of that. So we'll, no, we'll, 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 we'll pull back. No, I'm, no, I'm what saying, you said was he was appealing nothing... to white voters. And what yeah. I was trying to say is that what he's advocating could appeal to voters of all colors, right. except for the saying... fact that the narrative is being constructed by liberals and Democrats okay. to paint him as a racist because he has positions that they disagree with. Okay, but anyways, that's not what I'm saying. So I'm going okay. to move past that because right. what I'm saying is there's clearly nothing in that is, you could one say one hand say, oh well, his positions are not really anti-Hispanic or anti-black because of X, Y, or Z. Right. I think that's not really relevant to this because there's certainly nothing in his appeal, at least where Hispanics are concerned, where he's directly trying to say. You know, it's really imperative that I increase the percentage of Hispanics that we're getting, and we're going to do X, Y, and Z because of that, right? That's all I'm, I'm, I'm saying on that. And clearly the Republican consensus before Trump was it was really imperative that you doubled down on whatever you had that was um, interesting or appealing to Hispanics. And so at the very least, Trump isn't trying to do anything affirmatively to increase his support among Hispanics, whether you think he's – actively being anti-Hispanic or whatever is not relevant to that. But clearly there's a very different strategic decision about whether, where additional Republican voters or president are going to come from. Can and I, I think say that's, something? Can I say yeah. something? Okay. What I want to say is it's not unwelcoming to Hispanics to say to Hispanics, we are not going to have the definition of our country and the uh, integrity of our national polity compromised in a quid pro, pro quo trade-off with you about whether or not we're going to secure the border. That's not up for debate. We're going to secure the border. Now, those of you who are here and who are here legally, we welcome you. You're our fellow citizens, and we want to do business with you, and we want to move forward. But we're going to secure the border. Uh, and I want to contrast that with a position that says, if I can do anything to figure out how to get you to vote for me, I'm happy to put the integrity of my country on the bargaining table and maybe not secure the border so much and maybe renegotiate again and again and again what the legal regime is that determines who can be in this country and who can't be. Because I just made a, a poll calibrated calculation that I'll win Colorado and Nevada and New Mexico if I do that. Um, I don't see why if, if I was sitting in uh, Mexico City. And I was looking at the leadership of the United States. I'm a nationalist myself. I'm sitting in Mexico City. I'm a Mexican nationalist. And I'm looking at the leadership of the United States. And I've got a choice between people who want to split the difference in order to for an electoral calculation versus people who firmly assert their national interests. Obviously, I would choose the difference splitters. But I would respect the fact that the American people might choose the person who says America first. There's nothing anti-Hispanic about saying America first, especially to Hispanics who want to be Americans. Right. Again, I, I'm not asking about what's – I'm not – in some sense, I'm making an entirely non-normative argument here, right, which is simply that there's no evidence that the argument that you just presented turns out to be effective at appealing to Hispanics. Okay. Right? That all I'm saying is there's a very different electoral calculation. Now, I think there's a question about – if you're thinking that one of the the pillars of your appeal is going to be on immigration, right, and you had to have some degree of intelligence and policy sophistication, first of all, border security would not be what you would do, right? There's zero evidence that securing the border is a good way to actually get control of immigration, right? There's, in fact, some very significant evidence that it reduces reverse uh, reverse migration, right? 
So it actually that, you know, you know, the stuff by Doug Massey, that there's a circular flow. And the more you actually tighten the border, the more you reduce the number of people going back. Right. The what, one. What, what about is, the drugs coming in? I mean, a, it's not again, there's not much clear. I mean, I don't think there's much evidence of the last. 40 years of efforts at interdiction that any of it's ever made a big difference on the price of drugs in, on the street, right? Zero. There's really no evidence that interdiction makes a difference, right? What, We've been trying to do it for decades now, and there's no evidence it makes a difference. What about terrorists coming in? I don't see a whole lot of evidence they're coming. They're coming in by overstaying visas. Okay, so let me, let me summarize what I've just heard. There's no point in enforcing border security, A, because Mexicans – and others who might not be authorized to come to this country are basically trying to leave, not get in, and we should let them go out by leaving the border as loose as possible. And B, no. drug interdiction doesn't work. That's been, quote, proven by the evidence, close quote. And therefore, we don't have to worry about the fact that we have an opioid epidemic and that uh, illegal drugs seem to be being smuggled by Mexican drug cartels, even though the bodies are mounting by the tens of thousands in Mexico itself. That's not a concern for us. No, I'm not saying it's not a concern, but let's just take the immigration issue, right? Um, there's certainly one way that would make an enormous amount of sense to control the degree of Mexican immigration, right? And that's workplace enforcement, right? Yes. And wait, this is like, this is like the question about, do you, if you have a problem with prostitution, do you go after the prostitutes Got or the jobs, right. right? Right now, we're mainly going after immigrants by trying to increase penalties on them, right? Um, so maybe they spend, maybe we send them back, they come back here, that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, now politically, internal enforcement is a very hard thing for the existing Republican coalition to do, right? Because it means that we're going to put all our enforcement capacity on employers, right? And employers basically are the ones who own the Republican Party. So and this gets to my point about what could be different about, let me, don't, don't give me Come on, man, there are plenty of employers who are Democrats as well. Where do you think the money right. for the Democrats come from? No, but I'm saying that the um, – well, they come from finance and Hollywood. It comes from a very specific part of the workforce. But let me finish. Let me finish. I, I, what I'm saying is Silicon Valley people who want to hire Pakistani or Bangladeshi code writers are right. just That's as not, interested I, in getting that border loosened so they can bring that labor in as anybody else. And those right. people will vote Democratic. Like, no, but they're not the people who you're going to be doing raids on uh, on employers and closing down their factories because they're – employing, you know, low wage, undocumented workers. Okay. Right. It's not like there's huge underground warehouses of Pakistani coders somewhere in uh, in, uh, you know, Menlo Park. I don't think that's actually there's any evidence for that. So the point is, my only point is a really serious Trumpism would be all about severe internal enforcement. Right. A, because we know that we do know that that works. Right. That is, if there's nowhere for people to work, they're going to stop coming here. Um, whereas now we're basically saying we're not going to be doing very much enforcement at the workplace. So if you can get in, you'll be able to find a job and do it under the table. And lots of people do that. We don't put any resource in that. We put it all at the border, which is more of just a kind of ritual um, that uh, everybody knows doesn't actually have a big well, effect. Well, 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 you're you're now arguing about the relative uh, beneficial impact of different dimensions to what would have to be a multivalent policy in terms of immigration control. Uh, well, san sanctioning employers who hire people who are undocumented is one piece of that. Preventing people from crossing over the border is the other. And you're saying the latter is relatively less significant than the former, although Trump seems to be putting all the emphasis no, on the latter. I'm making but, a political but, but, point, which is that if, if you've got a coalition where you have to appeal – the people who want immigration restriction and you want to keep the Chamber of Commerce, the way you do that is you put a lot of money okay. into a border that doesn't make sense. I'm saying if one way to think about what Trumpism is, is trying to distance the Republican Party somewhat from its more Chamber of Commerce, golf club kind of coalition and take them less to the center and more say that the sort of working class whites are the center of the Republican Party, in which case you're more willing to have those more direct conflicts with low wage employers, right? Again, who are not so much part of the Democratic coalition, but are a very significant part of the Republican coalition. Right? Okay. Okay. So that, point. Right. So that that's the the point here is these policy things are also choices of who you want to appeal to, both in terms of voters and in terms of funders. Did you right? notice that Tim Kaine in the vice presidential debate didn't have anything substantive to say? 
about immigration control except to recant the uh, mantra about we'll work it out later and whatnot. Didn't have anything to say about deporting criminal aliens. What's wrong with that? Why shouldn't every criminal alien be deported? What would be the argument against that? Uh, didn't have anything to say about holding people who have overstayed their visas to account. Why shouldn't every person who is illegally in the country because they've overstayed their visa be identified and held to account? Whether or not you want to deport them, this will be a policy decision that can be worked out down the line. But why wouldn't one want to start with ridding the country of criminal illegal aliens and with holding to account anybody who's in the country without legal status because they've overstayed their visa. What could possibly be an argument against that? And, and moreover, how could asserting that as a desideratum be understood to be racist or anti-Hispanic? What it is is pro-integrity of American legal order. Right. Well, I mean, again, What's I'm wrong not, with I'm, that? I mean, I really want to know what's wrong with that. I mean, I'm actually not interested in whether something is racist or not. I don't even know how to... Okay, then let's put that to the side. What's wrong? What's right. wrong with having a firm determination to enforce the laws with respect to who should be in the country and I'll not. I'll say politically, the thing, that's, the, the thing that's the weakness of the, um, the Democratic Party on immigration is that nobody on the Democratic side can give you a coherent account of who should be in the country, right? Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to say, what would the level of immigration that we want be, right? Um, no, nobody can say, you know, how many high wage people do we want? How many people do we want from Mexico? What's the level at which we can absorb? Right. That conversation, Democrats always want to have the conversation to be about the stories of people who are here and they're doing a great job and whatever it is. It's kind of a humanitarian story. But the macro sort of economic or cultural uh, account, it's hard to give. And that's why Democrats always end up pushing the conversation off of that. Right. But just to go back to my point, okay, well, your okay. point about criminal aliens or visa overstayers, if there was a really rational Trump thing, right, again, it would be internal enforcement, which would also be an ID card. I'm not saying these are things I would necessarily be in favor of. But if I were Trump, I would say ID card. Everybody's got to have real ID. Right. And we're checking IDs. Right. And if you're overstaying, we're, we're getting, you know, we're, we're kicking you out. Right. Everybody's got to have papers. Right. Um, and you would be enforcing that at the workplace, right? You would be shutting down companies that are knowingly hiring people who don't have, you know, these IDs, right? That would be the thing if you really, really wanted to actually reduce the degree of American, you know, competition of workers with immigrants, that's what you would have to do. Can I just right? say, can I board. just say that I could see a Trump administration doing that? much, much quicker than I could see a Clinton administration doing that. I'm sure. I mean, again, I'm not saying, let me make it clear. I'm not saying it'd be a great idea if everyone in the country all had an ID card. I would be saying that would be what you, if you actually really wanted to deliver something, not symbolism, right, um, to these supposed white working class voters who are worried about competing with immigrants, that's what you would have to do, right? And you'd have to accept, right, that there's a significant civil libertarian consequence of that, which is we all have to have papers, right? But that's the only way in a country this big to actually enforce it, not that somehow you could build a border so high that they can't jump over it, right, which doesn't make any well, sense. Well, then let me ask you, since you don't want to take a position on the normative question, but you want to point out that there are different instrumentalities than what Trump has argued for, and since I have pointed out that those instrumentalities are more likely to be adopted by a Trump administration than a Clinton administration, I, I want to just ask you, what's wrong with the normative position that I want to have an effective regime of enforcement of uh, whatever it is that we determine to be the uh, guidelines and the laws that govern who should be in the country? What, what, what's wrong with that position? I mean, I think the argument is that the the actual level just go back to the civil libertarian point right i don't i really don't think there's any way to actually enforce our immigration laws without some form of universal and regular id and and checking ids do we want to be a country where that's what we're doing right where everyone has to have pay, has to have their papers right so, so you're right. saying there's nothing wrong with the goal, but that the only feasible actually, okay, for achieving normative, it are, are uh, contrary to civil liberty? My normative position is we should have lower level – my just straight up Steve Tellis position is we should have lower levels of, um, of legal and illegal immigration, right? I haven't figured out the exact level at which we have, but I think 
the level of immigration we've got now is um, is larger than we've been able to effectively not so much economically absorb, but culturally absorb. Um, and that the basic mechanisms of assimilation, right, um, can only work at a certain scale of immigration, right? Now, the degree to which I think we actually, as a policy mechanism, could it could have actually reduced this level, this increase in immigration? I don't know. I mean, I'm somewhat skeptical. I become somewhat of a neocon, an old neocon about whether or not this was something that the the you know, when you have two countries that are so close to each other, these labor forces are going to converge somehow um, and that you can create a wall and people are going to get around it. And I do wonder whether the degree to which this is a soluble problem, right? Just because it's a problem doesn't mean we can actually solve it in some way that's more than just a kind of uh, empty ritual designed to appeal to people who are not paying close attention. But I think we should have had, I think, I, I think we would have been better if we had actually had a slower degree of um especially when we're talking immigration we're really talking about mexican immigration right nobody's talking south korea right and i think we've you know we've just you know and now part of that was you know mexico is still you know a deeply problematic democracy and um if you know the real way the only way to reduce mexican immigration at that level would be to have mexico be slightly less of a basket case Right. So if you know how to do that, I'd be really interested in the in that solution. But I don't know that I don't know that you can have lar- large level immigration so long as the both economic and the political, you know, uh, stability of those two countries are so misaligned. OK, I mean, I don't want to argue with you about oh, right. your, you- your ideal vision. I, I'm, I'm not without sympathy for it. I, I would just point out, however, as you would, I'm sure, acknowledge it's a political loser. Nobody could ever go out and say this is a muddy problem of two huge countries with all kinds of uh, symbiotic uh, inter, uh, relations uh, laying right next to each other with thousands of mile border. And there's going to be a lot of leakage and there's going to be a lot of back and forth. And as a practical matter, there's not a whole lot we can do about that. And therefore, we need to really try to minimize the damage and accommodate ourselves to the reality of the fact that there are going to be these flows back and forth in both directions. Uh, and uh, that's the end of it. And this whole all these say- uh, chess beating about uh, defending national integrity, about having a border and having a country is it's romantic and it's appealing to, at a certain uh, visceral level. But at, when we think about it hard, it, it really isn't doable. I mean, I. I- Again, I don't think that 100 percent. I think there are things you can do, um, but the ones that are really worth it are not about creating remote sensing stuff out in the desert, right, in order to pick up, you know, maybe they're an immigrant, maybe they're, a, you know, a coyote, right? They're, they're the ones that really are much harder political conflicts about the degree to which we really want to put meatpacking employers in Iowa out of business, Right. Um, and I think those are those are much tougher political. So it's not it's not that it's entirely technologically impossible to do it, but it's politically very hard in a system in which corporations that employ large amounts of low wage workers um, want that labor. And are we really willing to put the force of the state against them? Too often in this conversation, we think about using the force against individual immigrants. Right. Um, again, okay. and I, I, I think both normatively that's problematic. And I think just in terms of actually reducing, you know, immigration flows, it's likely to be, you know, just going after one at a time, each immigrant. Is not I'm buying your second point. It's not effective. I'm not buying your first point about normative. I don't see what's normatively problematic about enforcing the laws about who we want to be in the country and who not to be in the country. Right. But my There's point nothing, was no one is entitled to be enforcing. Here. No, nobody's said hey, nobody said that. At least I haven't said that everybody's entitled to be in the country. I actually think that, again, the other point is that it's very hard to operate a welfare state at, a, you know, with, with a, with right. a level right. of um, population who, uh, you know, with a level of population heter- heterogeneity that we have now. Um, I don't know that I think everywhere where you've tried, there's been huge stresses on the welfare state. Yeah. That's not that I think we should have zero. I think we should have very substantial, but yeah, I think let's talk about, it, let's talk about something else. You want to talk about another issue besides immigration Uh, on which Trump has taken positions that you think perhaps could be better articulated in a different way? Look, I think, well, trade, I think, is a good example. Right. I think clearly Trump picked on a um, 
vulnerability in again the main thing is actually here to think about Trump as mainly directed against the pre-existing Republican party coalition, right? And so trade, he clearly picked that one because that was a vulnerability, right? Where Republicans own voters and um, uh, and the Republican Party's positions were misaligned, right? That there were lots of Republican Party voters who um, were afraid that they were, you know, competing against China or whatever it is, right? And that we had bad trade deals, um, but the Republican Party elite didn't want to be dealing with it, Right. Now, I guess I would say on that, that it is, in fact, true that there's lots wrong with American trade deals, but it's more the crony capitalism side of the story than it is the tariffs. Right. When people usually when most people ordinarily think about what's in a trade deal, they think it's full of changes to tariff policy. Right. And they it's oh, it's about how much we're charging China and a tariff before their products come in. Almost none of the trade deals we do anymore look at all like that. Right. They have almost no tariff com- content in them, right? What they really are is, for the most part, negotiations around changing the domestic policies of various countries, right? Mainly, what if you look at TPP, it's full of changes in intellectual property rules, right? Having nothing to do with tariffs. So my, so you keep pushing me to tell you what my normative position is. I'm for zero. I'm for unilateral zero tariffs. Right. I have the completely orthodox economic profession position on tariffs. Right. But that has nothing to do with what we do in trade deals anymore. Now they're all negotiations, mainly by very large corporations using trade deals to leverage change in the policy of other countries, mainly to export our intellectual property regime. Right. And if I was Trump, I would say, look, to hell with all that. Right. You know, we're a world of sovereign countries. Right. We can all have our own economic policy. You know, uh, you know, there's one argument about whether we should have tariffs high or low. Right. But we're no longer handing out lots of favors and using the power of the American state just to back up Boeing and General Motors and whatever it is uh, as they're trying to do, you know, these kind of mercantilist deals. Right. So TPP, all that other stuff, we're all we're all junking. We're junking it all. Right. Because, again, it, the weird thing about Trump is he keeps talking about these trade deals and NAFTA and all these things as if they're about tariffs and they're not about that at all. Right. And so I thought, I thought what he was talking about was jobs leaving the country and uh, manufacturing not taking place here and right. wanting to say to carrier air conditioner or Ford Motor Company or whoever it might be, uh, you know, Apple uh, computer, that uh, if you take the jobs offshore and you want to bring the products back, uh, well, there's going to be a price to pay to do that. So maybe I can talk you into not taking the jobs offshore in the first place. I'm not advocating any of this, but that's what I thought he was saying. Ah, so now you get to be in the position of the I'm not I'm not advocating it. I mean, let me just state in uh, two seconds what my position is, which is that I think uh, global incomes grow faster. And we're uh, on the whole over the long term more prosperous if we let goods and people uh, flow more or less freely across borders uh, subject to constraints. Now, the people who come. Uh, to work, don't have to become citizens who vote. That's something that we can decide by our laws, and they don't necessarily have to stay forever. And if they do stay forever, maybe they should learn English and uh, not be terrorists. But uh, goods and people should be flowing freely. That's going to maximize our prosperity over the longer run. But in the long run, as John Maynard Gates pointed out, we're all dead. And as these transitions take place, managing them is fundamental. And they're going to be winners and losers. And oftentimes the winners will be fat cats and the losers will be, you know, uh, Joe Schmo. And uh, somebody's got to speak up for Joe Schmo. Right. But again, I don't think that I mean, the, the thing that's interesting is that almost none of that has to do with anything we do in trade anymore. Right. The whole trade regime has basically just been captured by large businesses, right, who have nothing to do with the actual economic interests of ordinary workers. Right. And so part of what I would do is simply if I was. Trump is saying, the hell with it. We're not doing any of these trade deals anymore, right? Our, our tariffs are already basically really low, right? There's no reason to do that anymore. And then part of this would have been a larger sort of attack on crony capitalism, that both the, Democrat, both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are basically owned by large multinational I firms, see, see. right? And I would, I would, you know, if I was Trump, I would have said, on the one hand, right, no more, you know, no more handouts to the tax code, no more handouts through trade deals, no more, you know, I'm, I would be going, you know, deep into finance, right, well beyond the carried interest. And this is why I think this is Trumpite, right, because clearly 
with the carried interest deduction, he identified that this was a vulnerability yeah. in the pre-existing Republican coalition, right? But okay. you know, the next the next you know Trumpite Republican is going to go far deeper into that, right? Into the entire maze of subsidies we've created. Okay, no, I like it. I like it. So, you, so you're not necessarily disagreeing with his position to reject these trade deals, but you're framing it differently. You're framing it as a part of let's close down the Department of Commerce or whatever the functional. Uh, programs within the Department of Commerce, which are crony capitalists, uh, whatever. And and let's get out of the business of the mercantilism where we use our leverage in international negotiations to benefit, uh, you know, especially influential or uh, powerful uh, business interests and and uh, and and so on like that. Right. So the one way I mean, so this is that I'm finishing up a book with Brent Lindsay on um, rent seeking and upward redistribution now. And. Part of the argument of that book, and this is, you know, this would be the, you know, Trumpism with a human face, maybe, um, would be that um, there really has not been a reduction. People act as if there's been a huge reduction in the growth of the state and its intervention in the economy over the last 50 years. And our argument is that's really overstated, right? Um, there's been a lot of, uh, of rent destruction at the bottom, right? So if you were a trucker, right? There's been huge destruction in government created rents, right? Because we deregulated trucking. We got rent. rid of the Interstate Commerce Commission or whatever it was called. Well, we got right. We, you know, we we eliminated the Civil Aeronautics Board, right? So yeah. all the people who are having their the income airline fares, yeah, increased, right, who who are having their incomes increased by the fact that we had, you know, uh, that regulation, right, got um, got screwed, right. We've reduced unionization, right, which is in a way is a you know produces rent, rent seeking, yeah, labor, right. But at the same time, as we've sort of systematically cut high all high end corporate rent seeking has gone up, right. So that's true, right. We've had a huge increase in occupational licensing, which mainly um, uh, pushes upward, right. A massive increase in intellectual property protection, which that's is that's not rent seeking, or oh, if it's, it's rent super. seeking, it's good rent seeking. No intellectual property. Yes, you you right. have to provide incentives for people to produce the value in the first place. Um, you really, you really bought, you really uh, have have drunk the Kool Aid, man. Well, what Kool Aid? Look, look at the Millennium Copyright uh, Act, which is the one that extended copyrights for things like Mickey Mouse and Disney. Right? What it did is it retroactively increased all those those copyrights. Right? That is stuff that's already been produced, right? It increased the the copyright period for, it, right? Oh. So unless what that does is cause everybody, to go <laughs> okay, back that's a rent. I grant you that. <laughs> okay. I, the retro a, the retroactive extension of the length of the thing after the investment has already been made is a yeah. redistribution upward to the people who made the investment. Thanks. I grant right. you that. But that's a huge but, but, okay. deal, right? Okay, okay. Um, and but again, if you look at the you know and <laughs> most of the people though who are the the expert the real experts in intellectual property argue that, you know, what, what's remarkable, right, is how long the length of our um, our patents and copyrights are, right? Well beyond what's needed to incentivize um, innovation. In fact, That's an empirical question. Sectors. I'd like to see the evidence on that. I'll, well, I'll show it to you in my, our next book. But, the, um, <laughs> but you know, there's large, incredibly innovative sectors for which there's no patent or copyright, right? Fashion, right? Hugely innovative, right? They're putting out new stuff every year, right? But you can't sue somebody for a design of a dress or Steve, a skirt. Steve, let, let me interrupt just to observe that fashion cycles are a cultural phenomenon. How frequently people pick up the style section of the New York Times and feel that they have to go and shop for another suit of clothing is based on social interactive ideas about what's cool, what's hip, and what's new. Technological innovation. It sounds like you just described music. That could be another implication of the same of the same observation. Protection. Well, but hold on, you're changing the subject. I'm just trying. I'm just trying to make the point. I'm, 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 I'm just trying to it. make the point that drug innovation is a different thing from uh, from fashion. That's all I'm trying to say. In the in the interest of um, society as a whole, in protecting the property rights of people who have to make huge front end investments in order to produce innovations that increase the quality and the uh, length of our lives uh, is something that we all have an interest in. Uh, well, we're going to have to get into an argument about this, but it's also not obvious that the way, if you want to have innovation, that providing a monopoly after somebody's already produced something is the way to do it, as opposed to giving them prizes up front 
and then allowing the marginal cost to be zero of, of consumption. So anyways, I, I don't want to get into that. But my, my point is, if I was Trump or Trumpite, right, the point would be to say, look, you know, you working class, mostly white, maybe not just white, right, uh, voter, right, the Republican Party has basically been using you to massively upwardly distribute resources for the last 40 years, right? Whether it's finance or intellectual property, in my view, or occupational licensing or housing, all these things, right? Um, that's really what the Republican Party is going to do. And we're saying the hell with it. We're not doing that anymore, right? Those guys want to, you know, get their special deals. They're not getting it through the Republican Party anymore. This is our Republican Party. And we're about, you know, redistributing back down to the working class, right? As opposed, and, and not just giving them the table scraps, right? And that I think fits with the immigration story, right? Again, in my sense, an immigration story that where you're actually really trying to reduce the actual competition with working class, um, with immigrants rather than just doing a symbolic. Okay. Let me ask you, another, I got it. I, I mean, I like this a lot, Steve. I'm sorry to cut you off, but our time okay. is limited. I hear you. I hear you on immigration where you could focus on employers and who's really getting the rents out of uh, the uh, flow of, quote, illegal immigrants. I hear right. you. I hear you on um, on the other question about trade and uh, crony capitalism. What I want to ask you is this. So you have a Republican Party establishment that wasn't getting anywhere close to doing any of this popular stuff that you're talking about. Now you have a movement that comes along uh, that's led by this guy, Donald Trump, who doesn't quite get intellectually, at least not yet, the sophisticated conception of what, quote, conservative populism might look like, such as you've just described in those two areas of uh, trade and, um, and uh, immigration. However, what I want to ask you is, uh, as a student of political change, uh, the last book, for example, about how the uh, conservative Republicans changed their ideas about mass incarceration, of uh, the last book of yours, as a student of political change, uh, isn't the advent of Trump um, in, in necessary uh, of a Trump-like movement uh, in, uh, in Kuwait, uh, not really savvy about what the underlying structures of power dynamics are, but nevertheless kind of groping towards something? Isn't that a necessary step along the way of moving the state, dyed-in-the-wool, country club, uh, settled uh, order, Republican establishment in the populist direction that you're advocating. Yeah, I mean, I do think that it's it's the case that there was a lot of dry tinder sitting around the Republican Party, but somebody had to be sufficiently disconnected to the existing Republican Party coalition. There you go. In order to light it. Yeah. Right. And again, whether it was a good idea to light it or not, it's a whole other kettle of fish. Right. OK. Uh, but I certainly think this was a case where. Um, ordinary processes of change, right? Because another way to put this is the, you know, the, the path that I described as the thing that all the Republicans said they were supposed to do after 2012 was the path of least resistance for all the existing major Republican Party coalition members, right? Gun owners, you know, Chamber of Commerce, yeah. large businesses, right? All of them were okay with saying, yeah, let's, you know, Cut, finally cut a deal on immigration and we'll do a little bit here and there. It'll be nicer to women, right? They don't have to change anything that they were getting, any of the deal they're originally getting, yeah. right? Um, whereas the thing that Trump, again, especially a more coherent Trump thing, right, really involves to some degree saying you're going to be getting a much worse deal out of this coalition than you were getting before, right? In order to increase our political viability, you have to take a hit. You... Archer Daniels Midland and, you know, finance yeah. firms and everybody else has got it. And so that's why they were never going to do that on their own, right? This is the, you know, we have a general theory, actually an organization theory that organizations almost only get changed from the outside. They very rarely change from the inside. And this is an example of it, right? Only an exogenous shock like Trump would have forced it to do something that really involved imposing pain on one of its core coalition members. So I think in that sense, you're, you're right about that. Um, now, again, one question, though, is whether it means that the some really large set of voters is going to be left out of both parties coalitions. Right. That is, if the Democratic Party is getting more um, Sandersite. Yeah. Right. 
and the Republican Party is becoming less country club, right? right? Well, you know, there's a lot of voters in, you know, Greenwich, right? Connecticut, right? Who just don't have a, you know, or suburban Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, right? There's a whole sort of, you know, voters who we used to think of as sort of ordinary Republican core voters, right? Who just don't have a party anymore, right? Who are sort of the people who are socially moderate, and are we seeing evidence? Excuse me for interrupting. Are we seeing evidence in the polls uh, to uh, identify uh, this uh, this lost uh, uh, element that you're talking about of the electorate? Well, it's, I mean, it's in some sense, it's already <coughs> happened, right? That is, you know, if you look at those places like suburban Philadelphia, Bucks County, all those places, right. in, you know, in Fairfield County, Connecticut, right? The Republican Party has been losing steadily before right um, uh, already right it's been losing support in those uh, in those areas and those are exactly the areas where at least the polling i've seen has shown that trump is even more toxic in those areas right um especially among women in those areas in particular so i do think that there there's evidence that this is a that you know both party strategy arguably are detaching themselves from from one another. Um, and ordinarily, you would think, well, that would be an opportunity for some third party. But we just can't structurally. We're just not wired up for third parties for, you know, for that sort of in some sense. What's weird is that's also the more affluent part of the country is the one that's going to be least likely to have a party that it's a that it's a naturally attached to. OK, so now how do you react to the uh, this theme of the Trump uh, uh, platform? which is we're going to rebuild the military and we're going to take care of our vets. And how does that link, if it does, into your vision of what a conservative populism might look like? Uh, I mean, I mean, the weird just to go back to the thing about Trump's sort of military or foreign policy strategy. Right. The thing that's weird about it is he's clearly in favor of having a larger military that for the most part, he seems to be suggesting that we should never use. Right. So I'm not clear he has an idea of what it is you actually use military force for, right? If you were increasing the American military, you would be doing it because it's connected to a strategy like our pivot to Asia and we want to counterbalance against China and we want to have, you know, that that makes sense. But there's a complete disjuncture between his theory about how many, you know, I mean, in, in some sense, he's just suggesting we should have the military as a huge welfare program. If, if, if you if you haven't connected it to any actual coherent geopolitical strategy, which I don't think he has. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree so, with that. I agree with that. It, and that's an interesting point, actually, the disconnect, because he's, uh, you know, no more of these wars. America first. We're not going back NATO. We're not going to be the world's policemen. Uh, the Saudis are going to have to pay. Whatever, whatever. On the other hand, he says we're going to rebuild our military. America's going to be strong again. America's going to be respected on the world stage again. And I agree with you. There's a deep disconnect there. Or rather, there's an obvious implication that uh, should make you afraid of Trump, which is that he would want to use the military in order to try to make the point right. that we're not to be effed with because we'll blow the, you know, the uh, the S out of you if, if you mess with us. I mean, I, I mean, again, I think I think there's an argument that the thing that makes more coherent sense, and this also involves a strategy that involves detaching the Republican Party from previous coalition members, right? Is to say, look, we actually are going for more like the Cato foreign policy strategy, right? That is, we're just doing offshore balancing, right? We got a big navy, right? We can use a big navy to do whatever we want, but we don't need a huge you know, armed forces that's going to be occupying countries in large parts of the you know world and using our boys from West Virginia to do it. Right. We're, we're, we're done. We're done with that. Right. And that would in a way fit with his rhetoric um, is simply to say, you know, we're cutting the army deeply. We're going to maybe put more money into the Navy. Right. If we really need it to ensure our shipping lanes and everything else. But we're not creating an army that could even do things like, you know, like occupy countries in the Middle East anymore. Um, that's our way to ensure that we're not going to do it. So I would say that's the thing that a potential Republican Party going forward. Again, that's not necessarily my position. I think we may actually need to have an army to occupy places in the Middle East conceivably. But um, a coherent Trumpite one that really focused on white working class voters as their core would probably simply say we're going to have a credible commitment to ICE for not doing that anymore, which is we're not going to have the military that can do it. Right. I think that makes sense. And that that fits with the whole rest of the thing. Right. So with veterans and everybody else, we're going to 
do right by them and we're going to have a substantial welfare state for our people. And that does I do think that fits with the Trump that the, a lot of the thing about veterans is really about, you know, that we need to have a larger welfare state for our people and not them. Right. And the veterans are clearly the ones who are on our side of that divide. Uh. I don't know if that squares with, I want to go into the inner cities. I can fix it. Uh, we're going to build stuff here. We're going to keep you safe and we're going to bring you jobs. It doesn't feel to me like the conception of uh, social welfare uh, implicit in the Trump view of the world excludes uh, African Americans. I think uh, and, the only unless you understand his, it. unless you understand his assertions to this effect, which he makes in every stump speech that he gives, to be a window dressing, which he's not sincere about. Yeah, I think that's pretty much my position, right? I mean, I do think that there's certainly, I mean, again, going to what, again, again, the real thing I want to do is just detach Trump from the conversation entirely, that, you know, Democrats are deeply vulnerable on the governance of American cities. Yes. Right? And a, and this is where I, I do think, so, you know, my position on what a real Trumpite nationalist thing would be, right, would be more of a coalition of whites and blacks and not Hispanics, right? Which is different in a way than the, the you know, the 2012 Republican story about what, you know, post-2012 would be, which is we're going to be nicer to Hispanics and not, still not do very much for African Americans, right? Now, now I, I, this would be to say that's the more nationalist one. No, right? I, I, I want to, I just want to take a smaller, I agree, the nationalists and the blacks and the whites. Doesn't have to exclude the Hispanics. It just has to not appeal appeal to Hispanics on the basis of having an open border. It has to not make the the uh, frame within which you approach Hispanics' interests as being uh, we're not going to deport people who are not here uh, in an authorized manner. You can well, appeal I mean, to Hispanics in the same way that you can appeal to blacks. Uh, we well, we want to do something for people who are on the margins. We want schools to work. We want jobs. Well, I mean, here's the, I mean, the real problem with with immigration, the weird thing about immigration is, you know, large numbers of immig immigrants, when you ask them in polls, say they want lower levels of immigration. Um, That's not and, they vote against, and they That's vote regularly against people who say they want to reduce immigration because they think they're anti-Hispanic. Right. And so but anti immigration can be separated from anti-Hispanic, anti-illegal immigration can be, be separated from anti-Hispanic. I mean, I actually think the legal illegal is a little bit of a shibboleth, right? The thing people really care about is what's the actual level of immigration. I think the illegal is the thing people talk about that uh, because it's a little more. No, 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 no I, I agree with you completely, Steve. But the thing we could control is the legal immigration. So if the issue is the level, the distinction between legal and illegal is fundamental. Because anyway. the only way you get to set the level is that you actually keep the illegal immigration to a low level. Right. But my, my, my and then you choose how much legal immigration you want. My only, my only point is that nobody has actually figured out how you actually appeal to, at least under current conditions, right, how you actually appeal to those immigrants who say they want lower levels of immigration but regularly vote against anybody who does it, right? And it may just be that the only person who could actually reduce immigration levels would actually be Democrats, right? I guess this goes to those signaling questions yeah. and okay. what if you think the underlying whatever it is, right? But let me and, come back to the national, the populist nationalism question in the blacks and whites. I like what you said, and I think it's worth exploring, which is to say there is a certain kind of conservative populism which might try to peel the Hispanics off from the blacks and the whites and make a certain kind of claim. And while it's ugly, and I'm not endorsing it, I'm not saying peel the Hispanics off and write them off, I'm not even trying to argue this as a as a strategy for some hypothetical populist Republican, but I do want to entertain the idea uh, from the African-American point of view that nationalism might not be necessarily a bad thing because we are indigenous sons of the soil here. We've been here for quite a long time. So we're insiders in a certain sense. Now, we're marginal insiders. We haven't been included. We've been discriminated in, and excluded and so forth and so on. But if you were to say... Let's define the country as the people who are here in an authorized way, and let's then unify the country around those people who are here. That's a kind of nationalist uh, stance that would be entirely consistent with Trump's America First-ism, and that could redound to the benefit of African Americans. Right. I don't know. I don't know about redound to the benefit. Of that. I mean, I'm I, I, I'm a little suspicious of that. But I think politically, right? We want jobs for our not, people. It's not. It's not inconceivable to me that the right messenger, who's not Trump, right, couldn't make an essentially populist nationalist argument that would be 
coherent and would be successful with 20 to 25 percent of African Americans. So why right? why can't Trump make this argument? He is making it, as a matter of fact. Well, he's making it, but he apparently is getting is you know they they're having to come up with new ways to measure the bottom of the uh, you know I mean nobody I mean again a lot of these polls are problematic. Look, you you got you got your first be, black president of the United States, and you've got your first lady, and you've got your pretty much uniform uh, elite press cadres and so forth with a drum beat. Okay, so I don't know what the polls are going to end up showing at the end of the day in this particular election cycle. But taking a longer view, I see no reason why that kind of appeal couldn't be successful with African-Americans. Right. And again, I, I, I don't know that I mean, by successful, I mean, all Republicans really need is to get from getting nothing. Right. Effectively. That, that's what I mean, to get 25 and 30 percent of the vote. Right. And I think it's also the set of, of voters who are in favor of. You know, who are who are less sympathetic with Black Lives Matter, uh, African Americans are more religiously orthodox, right? There's that's you know you're never going to get oh, 50 percent. I just think Republicans just there, there's no way to get there from here. But again, all you need in Ohio and lots of other states is to get 20 or 25 percent. And I think that populist nationalist thing that says you're part, you know, you're part of the country, you're part of us. In some sense, you're part of orthodox morally orthodox america right um uh at okay. least that, that part african-americans are. Let, let's dig just a little bit deeper okay. uh, i want to put people back to work there's too many taxes and there's too many regulations i want to bring jobs back to the areas where there are the unemployed like in the inner cities uh i'm a pro-business builder uh, i'm a, no, a guy who knows i get in now forget about trump for a minute forget about trump uh, think about jack kemp J- just think about uh opportunity society kind of thinking what's wrong with that in uh, contrast to the great society liberalism that we've had a half century of uh, of uh, you know mixed results from uh, for African Americans what's, well, what's turns out, okay I could go well, on I think, you hey, I think it turns out that neither one of them have turned out to be very successful right that is places where we did enterprise zones now again it hasn't really been tried been, what Hasn't really been tried. And that's what people said about communism. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, but I mean, well, the point, and I think it's not, you know, not accidental that when you actually tried to do things like enterprise zones through the actual political system, they ended up looking like model charter cities, schools, which, charter schools, with, by which I mean, not just the particular policy of charter schools, but a general determination to reshape those institutions in a way that makes uh, the primary uh, uh, beneficiaries of what they do, the students and their families, as yeah. distinct from the incumbent workforce that's, uh, that are unionized well, you know, public I'm, employees. Well, you know, I'm, I, I mean, you know, half of our family's income comes from pushing for charter schools. So, um, no, but, but I'm not just asking you personally. I'm, I'm saying, saying it's a normative ad- position, but I don't think there's been any evidence that, that that is ever, you know, and people keep trying, right, to use that to peel off or change black political opinion. Um, but even people who go to charter schools, it's not clear that that changes any of their preferences. Right. And I do think because that sort of meta question of does, you know, do Republicans really are really really willing to do anything for us? Are they really willing to deliver for us? I mean, the Republican Party has gotten itself to the point where it's almost not even competing in major cities. Right. So African-Americans in major cities don't even see people trying to get their votes. Um, that would actually eventually change their – so I think that's the problem is a lot of those policies – That's one uh, of the reasons why I think Trump's direct appeal to African-Americans is so significant, regardless of the effectiveness of the policies he's advocating or whether or not a lot of people come around to him. I find it to be very significant that the leader of the Republican Party, the presidential candidate, is in every one of his stump speeches – Going out of his way to say, uh, what does he say? Uh, one country, one people, one one God, one flag, and uh, then he goes on to say, "I want to rebuild these cities. I'm going to make it my major priority and whatnot." And whatnot. You can't tell me that kind of rhetoric doesn't doesn't symbolize something. I mean, I'm, I contrast it with the uh, hope and change rhetoric of Barack Obama in 2008. Barack Obama, the first black president, ran on a hopeful hope and change, uh, one America, whatever, whatever. Uh, we've had eight years to see what that led to. It didn't lead to what he promised us. Um, I, I rather like the idea, even as quirky or weird or idiosyncratic or unacceptable, if you like, a candidate is uh, Donald Trump for the Republicans, is talking directly to inner city people, vote for me, what do you have to lose? I'm going to fix it. 
Okay, maybe that's all empty, uh, whatever. But I want to hear a response to that from the other side that says, no, he's not, but we will. Right. Well, again, I do, and I do think that the, I mean, the, the education, we should wrap up in a second. Yeah, we're over now sure. Of it. No, that's I mean, the I education mean. issue is an interesting one in that that's an issue that's gotten more polarized, right? That is the number of Democrats, you know, if you even look at Hillary Clinton, right? Hillary Clinton's much more hostile to charter schools now than she was just four or five yeah. years ago. And that's reflective of general polarization of the two parties. Now, yep. one question is, one reason why maybe the charter school or education issue hasn't really led to any kind of realignment of African-American voters is it wasn't so clear which way it cut in partisan terms, right? Now, it much more clearly does, right? That is, it's a lot, you know, you don't have Democrats running like Barack Obama did, right? Barack Obama ran very strong supporting education reform, supporting charter schools, all that stuff did way more on all that than George W. Bush did, right? If you look at what his education department actually did, education reformers love Barack Obama for the most part, right? But most of what Hillary Clinton is arguing for, right, is cutting back on charter schools, criticism, attesting, all that kind of stuff, right? So it could be that that's actually creating an opening for the Republican Party by so polarizing the issue that the percentage of African-Americans who actually are supportive of education reform now know the only place they got is the Republican Party in a way they didn't just a few years ago. All right, Steve, we're going to make that the last word. We're over an hour. All right. uh, thanks for talking to me, Steve. I got All right, an education. Uh, that rent-seeking thing uh, really has uh, left an impression upon me. All right. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Take care.